Chapter 34 Freedom for South America Simon Bolivar, the Liberator Let's imagine now that we can leave Napoleon's grave in St. Helena and travel back in time and in space. The cool spring air grows suddenly warmer. The rocks of St. Helena fade away. Look down at your feet. You're standing on thick green grass. Hot summer sun pours down on you. A few feet away, a servant on his hands and knees clips each blade of grass to the same length with a pair of shears. You're standing on the tennis court of the Royal Palace in Madrid, Spain. Two young men with rackets are batting a tiny cork ball, bristling with goose feathers, back and forth. The Queen of Spain sits beside the court beneath a gold and crimson canopy fanned by her maid. The year is 1799. Over in France, Napoleon has just become first consul. But here in Spain, the royal family has no idea that they will soon be driven from power. The queen has invited a visiting guest from the Spanish colonies of South America to play tennis with her son, Prince Ferdinand. Prince Ferdinand isn't playing very hard. He hasn't even taken off his fancy cocked hat. He expects that his guest, 16-year-old Simon Bolivar, will let him win. But young Bolivar is doing his best to knock the ball past the prince's racket. He swings the racket high above his head and drives it towards Prince Ferdinand's head. The prince, startled, drops his racket and ducks. The ball knocks off his hat. The queen lazily claps her hands. But Ferdinand stands up, his face red with fury. How dare you, he hisses at Bolivar. Apologize at once. Why, Bolivar answers, it was a fair shot. You have no right to beat me at tennis, Ferdinand snaps. You, you, you creole. He grabs his hat and stalks away. The game is over. Bolivar stands on the tennis court alone. His family owns a huge estate in South America in the Spanish colony of Venezuela. He has been sent to Spain to see the land of his ancestors. He is well-educated, good at fighting and riding, strong and brave. But over here in Spain, he will never be able to become an army general or a Spanish minister of state. He is a Creole, a Spaniard born in the colonies, and those jobs are given only to peninsulares, natives of Spain itself. The Creoles of Bolivar's own colony, Venezuela, had been unhappy with Spain for many years. Not long after that tennis game in Madrid, a Creole named Francisco de Miranda tried to convince the other Creoles to join him in driving the Spanish governor and soldiers out of Venezuela. But the rebellion failed. Miranda had to flee to London. By then, Simón Bolívar had spent several years traveling through Europe, reading the books of Enlightenment philosophers like John Locke, and learning about the revolutions in France and the United States. Bolívar knew that other colonies had thrown off the power of the countries that founded them. He made up his mind that Venezuela would join them. I swear before the God of my fathers, he vowed, I shall not rest until I have broken the chains that oppress us. And when he returned home to Venezuela, he soon made his plans clear. At a party held by the Spanish governor, he was asked to lift his glass and make a toast. Other guests had already toasted the king of Spain, wishing him long life and health. But Bolivar stood and lifted his glass for a different kind of toast. I lift my glass to the honor of the king of Spain, he said, but I lift it higher for the freedom of South America. Soon Venezuela's chance came. Napoleon marched into Spain, took the throne away from Prince Ferdinand and his family, and declared that his brother Joseph would now rule. A little group of army officers called a junta gathered in Seville to fight against the French invaders. Portuguese and British soldiers came to Spain. Battles raged across Spain's villages and fields. The Creoles of South America believed that the junta was too busy with Napoleon to pay much attention to Venezuela. Encouraged by Bolivar, the Creoles picked up weapons, drove the Spanish governor out of Venezuela's capital city of Caracas, and declared Venezuela free. Bolivar became a colonel in the new Patriot Army. 
Francisco de Miranda came back from London and became the Patriot Army's commander-in-chief. The South American War for Independence had begun. Far south, the colony of Argentina had already declared its own independence. Not long afterward, Paraguay, just north of Argentina, announced that it too was free. But the Spanish weren't willing to give up their empire just yet. A regiment of Spanish soldiers left the fight against Napoleon and sailed west across the Atlantic. They arrived at Venezuela's most important port, ready to recapture the colony for Spain. Bolivar was in charge of defending the port. But one of his own Patriot officers decided that the rebellion had been a mistake and convinced other Patriot soldiers to join the Spanish invaders rather than to fight with Bolivar. Bolivar had to retreat. He sent a message to Miranda begging him to come help, but Miranda had already decided that the war for independence was doomed. He was making plans to board a ship and flee back to London. Bolivar and the other Patriots were furious. They stormed into Miranda's house took him prisoner, and locked him in his own fortress. When the Spanish arrived, they found the leader of the rebellion already in jail. They sent Miranda to Spain, where he spent the rest of his life in a Spanish dungeon. Bolivar was forced to flee from Venezuela so that he too wouldn't end up in a Spanish jail, but he didn't go far away. He traveled to the neighboring colony of New Granada, which had also declared its independence, and pled with the Creoles there to help Venezuela. The New Granadans agreed. Bolivar became a colonel in their army. He had fewer than a hundred soldiers, but he led these soldiers into attacks on towns held by the Spanish along the border of Venezuela. His little army managed to drive some of the Spanish out. More soldiers came to join him. His army grew. After two years of war, Bolivar had fought his way all the way back to the capital city of Caracas. He marched into Caracas on August 6, 1813, and declared that Venezuela was free. For the second time, the people of Venezuela welcomed him. The Liberator, they cheered. From now on, Simón Bolivar would be known as El Libertador. But the war for independence wasn't over. Spanish soldiers still had control of many of Venezuela's cities, and the Spanish generals had a trick to play on Bolivar. El Libertador and his followers claimed that their rebellion would throw off the rule of Spanish aristocrats, just like the French Revolution, which had given the common men and women of France power. But all of the leaders of the Venezuelan rebellion were Creoles. They owned huge estates and ranches. Bolivar himself had inherited farms, copper mines, and an enormous mansion. Out in the open plains of southern Venezuela, much poorer men made their living herding cattle. These cowboys, called llaneros, hated the rich Creoles. They agreed to join Spain in the fight against Bolivar. Bolivar couldn't manage to drive off the combined army of Spanish soldiers and rough-riding llaneros. In less than a year, this army was marching into Caracas, once more claiming it for Spain. Bolivar had to flee to the nearby island of Jamaica, which was owned by Great Britain. Even worse, Spain had finally managed to drive Napoleon out. Ferdinand, the prince who had lost that tennis game so long ago, was now King Ferdinand VII of Spain. He sent 11,000 soldiers to South America. The rebellious colonies were soon back under Spanish control. Napoleon was dead, and Europe was free. But El Libertador was in exile, and the Spanish colonies of South America had lost their brand new independence. <laughs>